Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we have a nice full house. Thank you all for coming. Um, someone reminded me that we probably ought to give Dr. Jones a round of applause as he's retiring this year. Because he's retired. <laughs> <laughs> he is retired. So, um, I'll get on with it. I understand that uh, he needs every second that he can squeeze out of it. So, without further ado, I'll introduce someone with no, who needs no introduction to all of you, Dr. Jones from Chemistry. All right, thank you, Dr. Neering. You know, it's always dangerous when you applaud before a presentation because it may be that the presentation is not worth applause at the end. So I, I just thank you in advance. Um, so the topic today is molecules that changed history. And I need to give a few disclaimers first. One, I am interested in history, but I'm not a historian. Facts and figures and names and dates don't always come readily to mind, so I will be referring to my notes. Okay. Second thing is that there's no way that in a, I know that this is supposed to be about 45 minutes. I'm just not sure whether I can uh, keep it to 45 minutes or not. I'm going to try, but there's many molecules that maybe you really wanted to learn about that are not going to show up here. Okay. So that means there's plenty of room if anyone else would like to do a Molecules That Changed History Part 2, that uh, there's plenty of room for that. So these are the major sources that I used for the talk, a book called Napoleon's Buttons um, by Penny Lee Couture and Jay Burson. This is written more for a general audience. You don't have to be an organic chemist to get an appreciation for it. The other text is by Casey Nicolau. It's called Molecules That Changed the World. This is written more for a practicing organic chemist, or at least someone who's been through a little bit of organic chemistry to have a better appreciation, because it's a bit more synthesis-based than the other one. We're going to start with just a brief introduction. Not everyone in here is an organic chemist, so I need to show you a little bit about some of the conventions that we use. Then we're going to go into these areas. Spices in the age of discovery, molecules that fueled slavery, dyes in the development of chemical industry, and better living through chemistry. Some of you are perhaps old enough to remember when that was a slogan that DuPont used. It's no longer the slogan that DuPont uses, but I still happen to believe in that, at least to some degree. So <coughs> the molecule that you see on the board here is a compound called eugenol. More about that in a few minutes. This representation is a Lewis structure that shows all the carbons, all the hydrogens, all the bonds. And this provides the most information about the structural nature of this molecule. It is, however, rather cumbersome to draw, and it takes more time. So organic chemists have developed shortcuts that we can use to convey the same information. You know, once you know what the tricks are, you get the same information, but it's much quicker to draw. So here is that same molecule. You can see that this carbon with the three hydrogens attached to it, now are represented as a CH3 group. The individual carbons are no longer shown, thank you, as individual carbons, but instead as vertices where lines come together. So right here, for example, is a carbon, this particular carbon, and it's bonded to two hydrogens. Since we know that carbon forms four bonds, any bonds which are not explicitly shown are assumed to be to hydrogen. So this represents the CH2. Over here at the end of this double line, or the end of a double bond, we have another CH2 group. That's these two hydrogens here, and so on. So this is called a skeletal structure. This part is kind of a condensed, so we might say this is a hybrid structure, both condensed and skeletal. And it's this type that you'll see throughout the rest of the talk. All right, so we begin with a molecule that has a name, piperine. Piperine comes from this. 
What is on the screen? Pepper, black peppercorns. Courtesy of the Valley Food Co-op, where you can get the best spices in town, <laughs> is a little bag that's not a plug or anything. <laughs> you know. But I love the smell of black pepper, so I'm going to get the first uh, whip, and then we'll see whether you can pass it around. Black pepper corns come from the Pipper nigrum plant. Uh, it looks something like this, the fruit hanging down in a long chain. And the structure of piperine is this. Um, this functional group, this particular arrangement of atoms is called an amide functional group. And then we have some alkenes, an aromatic ring. And then this rather unusual ether structure is called a methylene dioxy unit. And we may see that again uh, later on during the talk. Certainly we're going to see this functionality again later in the talk. Well, black pepper, the reason that black pepper starts us off is because this was one of the most important spices in early times. Marco Polo, actually, there's a picture of Marco Polo, established what we might call the spice route, traveling from Italy and going through Turkey and Persia and China, Mongolia, and down around here through India. India is where the majority of black pepper was grown at that time. Coming back up here, established these trade routes that went through Venice. Pepper was used as a spice to season food. Uh, the Romans used to use it for covering up the taste of rancid foods and, and things of that sort. It has a nice little bite to it, especially if you can get fresh ground black pepper. Um, and because his route went through Venice, Venice became known as the spice capital, and the merchants of Venice became spice kings. And it was a pretty profitable business. Profitable enough that other countries wanted to horn in on the action. But pretty much the overland route was taken up by the Venetians. Okay. So, Vasco da Gama. Portuguese sailor took a trip going from Portugal around the west coast of Africa, past the Cape of Good Horn, up here to Calicut, which is near the southern tip of Africa. Interestingly enough, so this was in 1498 when he reached Africa. By the time he got around, I'm sorry, by the, he reached India in 1498. By the time he got around the Cape of Good Horn, he had already lost half his crew. <coughs> Keep that in mind, okay? On that long ocean voyage, he had already lost half his crew before getting to India. Once he got to India, he was rather dismayed to learn that the, the uh, rulers of Calicut certainly were interested wow. in uh, establishing a pepper trade with with Portugal, but they wanted gold in trade for the pepper. He didn't happen to have gold with him. Since he had lost half his crew, he was in no position to try to overthrow Calicut, and so essentially left empty-handed. Went back to Portugal, five years later returned. <coughs> but this time, he returned with more crew, soldiers that had guns, and proceeded to overthrow the rulers of Calicut. By doing so, Portugal was able to dominate the pepper trade because it was easier, actually, to go around than to do the long, circuitous overland route. Spain, though, didn't want to be left out of the mix. Pepper trade was pretty profitable. They wanted to horn in on the action. This gentleman, you guys know who this is? This is Christopher Columbus, right, exactly. Christopher Columbus was able to convince King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that he could get to India by sailing to the west. 
instead of sailing to the east. Well, we all know how that turned out. <laughs> he didn't find black pepper, but he found another spice, another molecule that is certainly near and dear to my heart, and I think near and dear to the hearts of many people who live here, and that is capsaicin. I told you we would be coming back and seeing another amid functional group. Here it is. So Columbus was not able to take black pepper back to Spain, but he did take hot pepper plants from the West Indies. And now those were able to be cultivated, at least in parts of Europe. As a little aside, this is really pretty recent history, and my organic students from this year know about this particular one. About two weeks ago, researchers at New Mexico State University discovered a new world's hottest pepper. Did anybody else see that? Julie, do you remember what it is? I don't remember what it's called, but it's like 15,000 times nastier than Albania. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So this is the pepper. It comes from the island of Trinidad. It's called the Trinidad Moruga Scorpion. <laughs> So to, to give you an idea, Julie was talking about jalapenos. We measure heat of hot peppers on the Scoville scale, and jalapenos come in at about 5,000, maybe 6,000 units on the Scoville scale. The Trinidad Scorpion comes in at 1.2 million. <laughs> you know, there, there's, folks <laughs> there's folks here that are from the train corporation who are working on campus doing the energy savings uh, work. Um, and uh, one of the guys stopped by my office the other day and said, so I have seeds for the world's hottest pepper. And I said, the boot jolokia? No, so no, really, the, the real one, the scorpion pepper. Do you want some? Uh, and I looked at him askance. I like hot peppers, but not at a million Scoville units. <laughs> So Spain didn't get into the pepper trade through Columbus. The English, though, were able to get into the pepper trade. In 1600, the governor and company of merchants of London trading into the East Indies, better known as the East Indies Company, or the British East Indies Company, uh, was chartered in <laughs> London. And because the cost of these seagoing voyages was pretty high, they wanted to distribute the cost amongst various uh, folks. So the merchants, who were a member of the company, could bid for a share of a voyage. That gradually led to bidding on shares of the East India Company itself, which essentially is the precursor to what we now know as the stock market. So if you've done well in the stock market over the last year or two years, you can thank Black Pepper for <laughs> the role it had in establishing the stock market. This, by the way, is the great seal of the East India Company. So, but, but it wasn't just Black Pepper that was of interest to the Europeans. This spice also was of great interest. Eugenol comes from cloves. So we'll pass a bag of cloves around this way. Cloves grow on the clove tree. And eugenol, you've already seen a structure of <coughs> aromatic ring. And one of the things that you're going to notice is quite a few of these molecules do possess an aromatic ring, a six-membered ring with alternating double and single bonds. So eugenol, or, or cloves, were a pretty pricey spice back in the Middle Ages. Uh, some analysis that was done by an economist from the University of Toronto estimated that to buy a pound of cloves cost the equivalent of about 4.4 <coughs> days wages for a master carpenter in London. So you had to really want cloves quite a bit to be able to, to, to pay that much. 
another one, another spice uh, that gives this compound, isoeugenol, is from this. You guys know what these are? <laughs> nutmegs. There's quite a few people, I suspect, who have not seen whole nutmegs or used whole nutmegs before. So here are some whole nutmegs. Diana said that really the odor of whole nutmegs is not as pronounced as ground nutmegs. So you may not be able to smell very much with that one. But that is nutmeg, comes from the nutmeg tree. And there is the structure of isoeugenol. As you look at that, iso means it's an isomer, which means it has the same formula but a slightly different structure. And the only difference is the location of this double bond. In eugenol, the double bond is out here at the end of the chain. In isoeugenol, it's in the middle. <coughs> Nutmeg was worn in the Middle Ages in little pouches around the neck to ward off the black death. Whether nutmeg, it, it's entirely possible that isoeugenol and perhaps some other components that are found in nutmeg have insect repellent qualities. Uh, isoeugenol, for example, is found in, as a component in citronella oil. Um, but whether it really served that purpose or whether it was just that the people who could afford to buy nutmeg and not use it as a spice, but instead wear it around their neck, probably were affluent enough that they didn't live in the same squalid conditions where all the rats and fleas and other carriers of bubonic plague were located. Now, at that time, in the Middle Ages, these two spices, cloves, and nutmeg were grown only on the Maluka Islands out here, about 1,600 miles west of Jakarta in modern-day Indonesia. Getting there was a pretty big deal, okay? Um, and so that's the main reason why they were so pricey. Magellan, Ferdinand Magellan, was a Portuguese seaman but apparently it had some sort of a falling out with Portugal, and so he was sailing under a Spanish flag when he left Spain in 1519 with five ships and 265 crew members. Okay. Sailed from Spain down the coast, down the, west, the east coast of South America, across the Pacific Ocean, and eventually ended up over here in the area around the Malucas. So when he set out from Spain, he was hoping to find an early cut through the landmass of South America. He did get to a big opening in the Atlantic Ocean, assumed that it was the shortcut he had been looking for, proceeded to sail up and was bitterly disappointed that all he had found really was the estuary for the Rio de la Plata. And now this is where modern day Buenos Aires is located. Sailed up here for quite a while until he could see land on both sides and realized that he had made a terrible mistake, turned around, came back, took him a year then to go from Spain all the way through the Straits of Magellan which really was an opening between the Atlantic and the Pacific. He had lost one ship by that time, by the time he got to the Straits of Magellan. So four ships made it through. He, his first landfall after crossing the Pacific was on the island of Guam. And then that, that was in March of 1521. Then as he continued to sail, he got to the Philippine Islands, the island of Tectan, and was killed in a skirmish with the natives. Um, that was in April of 1521. The rest of the crew did eventually make it, though, to some of the Spice Islands. They landed at Ternate here, which at that time was the home of clove trees. Um, after another year and a half or so, they made it back to Seville. One ship was left, 18 crew members. 
93% of the starting crew had died in that voyage. Okay, keep, keep those numbers in mind. Okay. The voyage was three years. So they arrived in Spain, uh, or back in Spain, in uh, would have been 1522. Okay. So I want you to look at this little set of islands here, the Banda Islands. For most of the 1500s, the Portuguese controlled the trade in spices, well, the uh, nutmeg and clove trade. Portugal and Spain did. And then in about 1600, the Dutch started elbowing in. And they signed a treaty with the village chiefs of the Banda Islands. Here's a blow up of the Banda Islands. So right in here, you can't even see them on that map. Signed what they assumed was an exclusive treaty with the village chiefs that they would have complete uh, access to the nutmeg grown on the, on the uh, islands of Banda. The village chiefs maybe didn't have a concept of exclusivity because they were more than willing to continue working <laughs> with any trader who would offer them the maximum price. <clears throat> the Dutch were not happy at that. <laughs> and over a period of decades, actually, the Dutch exerted their control militarily, constructing multiple forts on the islands and destroying the nutmeg tree groves every place except right around the forts. The only, the only hitch in this was at this little island of Run. And it is a very small island. It's about one kilometer wide and three kilometers long. Had plenty of nutmeg trees though. The Dutch could not oust the British, who had a presence here on the island of Run. So after attempts at laying siege and forcing the British off the island, finally the Dutch and the British signed a treaty. This was in 1667, a treaty called the Treaty of Breda, or Breda, I'm not really sure, B-R-E-D-A. And in exchange for the British giving up their rights to the nutmeg trade on run, the Dutch gave up their rights to the island of Manhattan. So New Amsterdam became New York because of nutmegs and isoeugenol. Long sea voyages were a part of the age of discovery. Many deaths occurred on shipboard during these long voyages. And, and a lot of it was due to the rations that the sailors had. Because they were traveling across these great ocean expanses, they couldn't stop at, uh, at a port every so often and replenish supplies of fresh fruit or vegetables or things of that sort. Typically, fresh supplies would only last for a few weeks, maybe six weeks tops, before they would go rancid or run out completely. Um, and that led to the development of scurvy. Scurvy is a really horrible disease. We don't have very much of it anymore because we know what causes scurvy. But Symptoms included uh, weakening of limbs, gum disease, falling out of teeth, diarrhea, hemorrhaging from the mouth and the nose. Typically, the people died from a massive infection or from heart failure. Dried beef and hardtack were the common rations for sailors at that time. And uh, you can't eat hardtack if your teeth are falling out. <laughs> you can't chew on dried beef if your teeth are falling out. So it was a real issue. This gentleman is Joseph Lind, or I'm sorry, James Lind. James Lind was a Scottish ship's physician on the HMS Salisbury in the Bay of Biscay in 1747 he decided that he was going to conduct a little experiment. He was convinced that a lack of acid in the diet 
was a problem that was leading to the scurvy. So he took 12 seamen who were suffering from scurvy and divided them into six pairs. In addition to their regular diet, which at this point was something like sweetened gruel and boiled biscuits and other inedible sorts of things, <laughs> he, uh, he's, he started ministering different <coughs> rations. So two of the sailors, so one pair, two of them drank a quart of cider every day. Two of them drank vinegar every day. Two of them drank diluted oil of vitriol. That is an old name for sulfuric acid. <laughs> Aren't you glad you were not on the HMS Salisbury at that time? Two of them drank a half a pint of seawater. Two were fed a mixture of nutmeg, garlic, mustard seed, mirror gum, cream of tartar, and barley water. The final two, as a part of their rations, got two oranges and a lemon every day. In six days, that final pair were ready for duty. They had completely recovered from scurvy. So we don't have to drink sulfuric acid <laughs> to avoid suffering from scurvy. The molecule that is in this, that eventually was discovered to be the active ingredient, is this, ascorbic acid. Okay. Now, sometimes we think in the United States and at Adams State College that things move a little slowly maybe not as rapidly as we might like, but it took the British Navy 40 years after Lynn's discovery, after Lynn's experiment, 40 years before they started issuing lemon juice as part of normal rations for their seamen. This is Captain James Cook discoverer, or at least the European discoverer of the Hawaiian Islands, was the first to do a circumnavigation of New Zealand and sailed on long voyages. This guy epitomized on his ships the term ship shape. He insisted on proper rations, he insisted on cleanliness, all sorts of things that would keep a ship's crew healthy. He would stop at local ports and uh, whenever possible and get fresh grasses even, if there were not fresh fruits available, boil them up and have his seamen eat them. On the long distances between ports, the seamen were required to eat cabbage uh, in the form of sauerkraut. Now, uh, seamen at that time were used to hardtack and dried beef or dried pork. Sauerkraut was not a part of what they really wanted to eat, but he forced them to do it. And on a voyage to Australia from 1769 to 1770, because of that, he didn't lose a single seaman to scurvy. Cabbage, by the way, contains about 0.1 to 0.9 milligrams of ascorbic acid per gram of dried leaves. So it's a pretty decent source of ascorbic acid. You have to recognize that in the 1700s, 1800s, until really about 1950 or so, what we think of now as modern analytical instrumentation to help determine structures of organic materials, mass spectrometers, infrared spectrometers, NMR spectrometers, UV visible spectrometers, those were essentially unknown. So discovering the structure of a substance was no easy task. You had to have a large amount of a pure sample, which you could then deconstruct by running reactions, essentially the reverse of synthesis reactions, to break down molecules into smaller components and then reassemble them in a logical fashion to come up with a structure. Ascorbic acid's structure was not known when this gentleman, Albert Zentgeorgi from Hungary, 
first isolated a pure sample of ascorbic acid in 1928. He thought that he had found some carbohydrate type of steroid material because he isolated it from the adrenal cortex of a bovine uh, system. Uh, so he isolated it, did what little characterization he could, which was mostly just elemental analysis to determine a molecular formula. Sent a paper into a journal and proposed the name of this compound as ignos. Well, os is the common ending for carbohydrates. We have glucose, sucrose, and so on. The ig came from the fact that he was ignorant of its structure. <laughs> the editor was not amused. Sent the paper back, said we have to have a better name. So the second name that was proposed was God knows. <laughs> that also was not viewed with favor by the editor. So they settled on hexuronic acid. Hex because the molecular formula had been determined to contain six carbons and an aqueous solution of ascorbic acid was acidic. And if you look at this, those of you who, who are in or have been in my organic chemistry class will quickly recognize that there is no carboxylic acid functional group in this structure. But if you remove these hydrogens, you can stabilize the conjugate base by resonance very nicely, so it is an acidic material. Also, because of all the OHs here, you can tell that it should be soluble in water. Okay, so St. Georgie, um, finally in the mid-1930s, was able to find a better source of ascorbic acid in Hungarian paprika, and was able to isolate a kilogram of pure ascorbic acid. He had a collaborator in England, Norman Hayworth. He sent the ascorbic acid to Hayworth. Hayworth determined the structure. And in 1937, St. Georgie won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and Hayworth won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work on ascorbic acid, which we now uh, most commonly refer to as vitamin C. So it was this molecule that was able to uh, permit the long sea voyages without succumbing to scurvy once everybody agreed that having a lime or a lemon or an orange every day or every couple of days was a good idea. And it is the origin of the British term limey for, for British sol uh, sailors. We're going to switch gears now away from the age of discovery and into the age of slavery. Not necessarily uh, uh, a really wonderful time in the world's history. And slavery, I realize, has been going on for a long, long time. But in particular, in this section, we're going to be talking about the transportation of Africans to the New World. <coughs> Largely fueled by this molecule, sucrose better known as table sugar. All the OHs here, is it water soluble or not? Yes. yes. And you knew that even without the structure because you can put sugar in your tea and it will dissolve or sugar in your coffee or what have you. Uh, two principal sources of sugar are sugar cane and sugar beets. Sugar cane came to, or sugar, crystalline sugar <coughs> came to Europe in the 13th century with the return of the Crusaders. Um, and by the 16th century, it was the sweetener of choice. It had essentially replaced honey, or not replaced it, but so much supplemented it that it was in high demand. Um, the demand for the sugar really led to the development of sugarcane plantations as the Europeans started to colonize the New World. So Brazil, and Brazil now has huge sugarcane plantations that are used to make ethanol, and most of their liquid fuel is now ethanol instead of gasoline from these sugar plantations. The West Indies were also a place where sugarcane took hold, and in the southeastern U.S. as well. Sugarcane cultivation 
and uh, the processing of the cane to get sugar is a pretty labor-intensive process. When the Europeans colonized the New World, they brought with them their European diseases and really decimated some of the native populations. So between the natives and indentured servants from Europe, there was an insufficient labor supply. And that's when ships started bringing in Africans to harvest the sugar cane and do the processing. Very profitable, a very profitable, uh, very profitable business. And it contributed mightily to what we think of as the Industrial Revolution, as did this molecule, cellulose. As you look at this structure, I want you to pay particular attention to the parentheses that are around here. What that indicates is that cellulose is a polymeric material and it's huge. If, for example, we took a little piece of chalk and said that this was a sucrose molecule and I laid it down here, if we took all the chalk we could find and laid it on the surface of every table in this room, we would have a small representation of the cellulose molecule. It's a very big molecule. Look at all those OHs. Should it be water soluble? Yes, of course, but it's not, right? Otherwise, trees would dissolve in a rainstorm. So what happens is because of the linear structure of the cellulose, the chains stack on top of one another. Hydrogen bonding between the molecules doesn't permit the water to get in there and solubilize the cellulose. So cellulose is insoluble in water. Pure cellulose is found in this. The balls of cotton plants, or the bowls, I guess I should say, of cotton plants. The demand for cotton was pretty significant. Uh, by the Middle Ages, Arab traders had bought, brought cotton to Spain, but it really couldn't grow further north of Spain because of the weather. Cotton plants are sensitive to frost. In 1760, England imported two and a half million pounds of cotton. By 1840, that number had jumped to 352 million pounds of raw cotton. And vast areas of the Midlands in England had been converted from agricultural land into industrial factory towns with cotton mills and the associated uh, machinery that was, that was needed for that. The demand for cotton led, just like to the plantations of sugarcane, led to plantations of cotton. And just like sugarcane, harvesting and cultivation of cotton is a labor-intensive process. So again, slaves came in droves into the new world for harvesting cotton. Slavery had been outlawed in England in the early 1800s, around 1805 or so. But child labor was not. And so in these factory towns and around the cotton mills, children, from the time they were old enough to skirt around all the machines, were recruited to, to work under really pretty abhorrent conditions. It's estimated that only half the children born in these factory towns ever survived to the age of five, which was really horrible and it really disturbed the factory owners, but primarily because the kids didn't live long enough to become good factory workers. Okay. Well, <coughs> with that depressing note, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that I'm going to run out of time so allow me to skip over the next couple sets of slides which deal with dyes of antiquity, Tyrian purple and uh, <coughs> indigo, and get to a more modern color, mauve. <laughs> now I say modern, but you have to keep in mind that as an old fart, modern has a different meaning for me than it might uh, for you. Mauve 
was synthesized first in 1856 by this gentleman, William Henry Perkin. Perkin was 18 years old when he was studying chemistry at the Royal College of Chemistry in London under the auspices of August Hoffmann, a German who had been brought to establish a superior chemistry program in England. Hoffmann had the idea that quinine, which was known to be useful for treatment of malaria, could be synthesized from materials found in coal tar. And this is during the Industrial Revolution. Coal tar was abundant in England at that time. Well, one of the ingredients in coal tar is this molecule, which is aldyl toluidin. It has a formula C10H13N. In the 1850s, the molecular formula of quinine was known, and it was almost double that. So over Easter break, Perkin thought, you know, if I just treat the allyl toluidin with a good oxidizing agent, maybe I can get two of those molecules to hook up together and add in an oxygen or two from the oxidizing agent and make quinine. So this is what he tried. The formula for quinine is C20H24N2O2. So he thought, he took the oxidizing agent, coupled them together, split out a molecule of water, it would make sense. You have to realize that the structures were not known. All that was known was the formulas. Hmm. Didn't work. What he got instead was this tarry residue in the reaction vessel. He was pretty disheartened, but you know, he was only 18 years old, so he figured there's plenty of other things I can work on. Hoffman had taught him, as all good chemistry, professor, as all good chemistry professors do with their students, to clean up after themselves. And so he was cleaning out this tarry residue from the reaction flask poured in some ethanol, swirled it around a little bit. When he poured the ethanol out, it had a beautiful purple color. Intrigued, he took a piece of silk, dipped it into that ethanolic solution, pulled it out. The cloth was still purple in color. He tried to wash it out, couldn't wash it out. It seemed to be color fast. He sent it off to a Scottish dye firm. They did some evaluations of it, wrote back to him, in a very favorable response and said, look, you know, if you can do this on a regular basis, this will be a very valuable dye. The color, mauve, is a very complex structure. This is purported to be one of the possible structures for mauve. Okay? And it has a color like this, maybe even a little darker <coughs> than what Perkin is holding. <coughs> But Perkin, at 18 years old, said, okay, so if this works, then I don't need the Royal College of Chemistry anymore. <laughs> he left school, established a small factory to make mauve 17 years later. So 35, 36 years old, retired, a wealthy man, spent the rest of his days doing chemistry in his home chemistry laboratory instead of this. Unfortunately, when Perkin retired, the dye industry, which had been essentially concentrated in England and France, <coughs> went out of business and it moved over to Germany. And by the turn of the century, so this is 1800 to 19, or the 1899 to 1900, that turn of the century, not the most recent one, um, the German dye companies had really taken over. 90% of the synthetic dyes were made by three companies in Germany, Hoechst, Bayer, and BASF, the Bottle and Anal or the, the Betische Anilin and Soda Fabrik. That's why we call it BASF instead. Uh, let's see, I have to decide what I can do in just five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to skip quite a ways ahead because I really do want to talk about 
this. Steroids and the pill. This is testosterone, the major male sex hormone. This is estradiol. This is progesterone. By the 1930s or thereabout, some of the functions of these hormones were becoming understood. Progesterone in particular had been demonstrated in the 1930s to prevent a second pregnancy in an already pregnant woman, probably because of its effect on luteinizing hormone. However, and, and, and at that time people were proposing for it to be used as a contraceptive. The problem is that it can't be taken orally because it breaks down in the digestive system. So the search was on for uh, either a better source of progesterone, because at, at that time it was only obtained from pregnant mares and cost about $1,000 a gram. So a more inexpensive method of obtaining progesterone or perhaps a different, uh, a different steroid it, it entirely was necessary. Enter Russell Marker. Russell Marker earned a bachelor's degree and almost a PhD from the University of Maryland. He had completed his dissertation, turned it in. It was published in Journal of the American Chemical Society, but his professors felt he needed one physical chemistry class at the graduate level in order to graduate. He didn't agree with that, so he left. After three years, he got a job working at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. He wanted to work on steroids. He had really become fascinated with steroids. But, and he, he felt that there had to be some plant source. Unfortunately, at Rockefeller, because of their division of labors, plant studies, plant chemistry was in the Department of Pharmacology. The president of Rockefeller Institute forbade Marker from trying to work on plant steroids because he was in the wrong department. So he left Rockefeller, <laughs> went to Penn State. There was a collaboration between Penn State and the Park Davis Drug Company to do steroid work. This was great. This is exactly what Marker wanted to do. After searching around the world, he found that this plant, which is a Mexican yam, yielded large amounts of this steroid, diosgenin. And Marker was able to synthesize in five steps progesterone from diosgenin. Lucrative market, perhaps. Penn State and Park Davis did not want to pursue a foreign patent because Diastinin came from Mexico, didn't come from the U.S. So what did Marker do? He left. <laughs> Went to Mexico and established his own company, Syntex, for synthesis in Mexico. That was in 1944. Had some disagreements with the company after it got established. What did he do? He left. And so, in fact, he got so disheartened with the whole system that in 1949, he destroyed his laboratory records and never went back to chemistry. Percy Julian. There's a very interesting set of stories about Percy Julian, one of the premier black organic chemists. He was working in the mid 40s and 50s for a Glidden paint company and discovered that you could, uh, uh, you could get large quantities of steroids from soybean oil. This was the steroid in the so soybean oil, stigma sterol, and he developed a method to make progesterone in large quantities from this. Uh, it's uh, said that his first uh, can I find this? That his first uh, batch, his first pound of progesterone that he was able to synthesize from stigma sterol was worth $63,500 and was transported to the purchaser in an armored vehicle. 
Glidden didn't really want to do much more with this. They were, after all, a paint company, not a pharmaceutical company. Enter Carl Jurassi, who, who is still alive, by the way. Carl Jurassi, in 1949, went to Syntex in Mexico from Ciba, now Ciba Geigy, a Swiss pharmaceutical company. They had a plant in New Jersey. He wanted to work with steroids after he got his PhD at University of Wisconsin. Ciba had other plans. They, they reserved all their steroid work for the chemists in Switzerland. And so that's why Jurassi left Ciba and went to Syntex. His first task was to convert diostenin, again, the, the uh, Mexican yams, into progesterone, or uh, not into progesterone, into cortisone. That was profitable. Cortisone is used in a variety of applications. His next project was to make estrone and estradiol, again, starting with the same steroid. And finally, in 1951, he synthesized this, which is called norethindrone. Patented it in 1951. That same year, Margaret Sanger, the founder of International Planned Parenthood, Catherine McCormick, from International Harvester Money, and Gregory Pincus at the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology had a meeting in which Sanger said to Pincus, you should really develop a drug to prevent contraception that can be swallowed like an aspirin, or to, to prevent conception that can be swallowed like an aspirin. With funding from McCormick, Pincus undertook that task. And after meeting with John Rock, found that yes, there were some things that could be done for contraception. He wanted to make sure that progesterone really did that. And he sent out, Pincus sent out feelers to a variety of pharmaceutical companies asking if they had any potential candidates. Two of them came back. Norethindrone from Syntex and a very similar molecule, norethinodrol, from G.D. Searle and company in Chicago. Notice that these two are isomers of one another. The only difference is the location of the double bond. Here's the quick question for my organic students. Which of these two would you expect to be more stable? Norethendrone, because this is a conjugated pi bond system as opposed to this one. And in all likelihood, if you ingest this in your body, it just gets isomerized to this as the active oral contraceptive. So this was uh, taken, it was approved in 1960 for use as an oral contraceptive. By 1965, four million American women were on the pill. And depending upon your point of view, the pill is either credited for or blamed for the sexual revolution of the 1960s, the rise of feminism, women's liberation, and the increase of women in the workforce. <laughs> Many stories remain to be told. Okay. DDT and the rise of the modern environmental movement. That is quinine, which in the 1600s and 1700s was known as the Pope's powder and Protestants refused to take it for treating malarial symptoms. <laughs> There's morphine, penicillin, and we probably all know about Alexander Fleming's contributions to penicillin, but what we might not know is that Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkins was responsible for determining the structure of penicillin just like her work was important in determining structure of nucleic acids. Nitroglycerin <laughs> and the Nobel Prizes are intimately tied together. And finally, this is the structure. Here are those parentheses again, which mean that it's a polymeric material. This is Teflon. Teflon will always be tied to the development of nuclear weapons. 
because uranium hexafluoride, which is used in the density gradient centrifugation to separate out isomers of uranium, could only be contained in vessels made of Teflon. And Teflon was a military secret from the moment it was discovered until the 19, late 1950s. And at that time, it became available for nonstick cookware. So <laughs> <coughs> I hope that you've learned a little bit about some interesting molecules and how molecules really are important to history. And if you're interested, this is the library's book. So I'll take this back. You're welcome to go check it out. This is my book, but if you're really interested in reading about Napoleon's buttons, which I didn't talk about, then please come and get it. Thank you very much for spending Leap Day with me. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.